Did you hear about the explosion at the French cheese factory? No, I didn't. All that was left was debris. <laughs> You're so cheesy. Hungry Squared, Hungry Squared, bringing you the best food talk anywhere. Welcome to the Hungry Squared podcast where the brain and belly meet. I'm Sharon from the Wasatch Cooking Guide. And I'm Winter from the RedParty.com. This week, we are talking about fondue. And fondant. <laughs> yeah, let's talk about it. Hungry squared, yeah, hungry squared. Oh my gosh, Erin, how's your week been? It's been good. Has it? Yeah. Really? Okay, well, tell me, which, did you eat anything fun this week? Um, I did. I made cashew chicken at home. And oh. I was really impressed with myself. This is like American Chinese food. It's right. not fancy, mm-hmm. but the sauce turned out really good and had just the right amount of gravy thickness that I we, like. We love the gravy. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> so it was perfect. Well, good. Yeah. Where'd you get the recipe? The Pioneer Woman. Oh, got a lovery. Yep. And it was fast. Super fast. Oh, Weeknight good. dinner. Do so it. Go to her website. It's on there. I will put it in the show notes. What did you eat this week? So I had a good friend of mine. Her name is Sharon. Who gave me a gift? It was you oh, that gave me a gift. Me. Oh, oh yes. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yes. yeah. Yeah, you did. And you bought me. It, it was kind of a, I think it was a Christmas gift, but it came late because it was on yeah. back order, you guys. It, it was. So it was like your combination Christmas and birthday gift. Yeah, it totally <laughs> works out. <laughs> anyway, so Sharon got me something called a fondoodler. Fondoodler. I can't say that really well. Anyway, the fondoodler, I want to just describe it to you as a hot glue gun, but instead of a glue stick, it's a cheese stick in there. Yeah. <laughs> and you can put any kind of cheese in there. <laughs> and we tried it and we tried it with a little, just a Swiss cheese. No, uh, what are they called? String the, cheese. Yeah, the string cheese. It's a little interesting. I'm just saying. It's cool. <laughs> it was interesting. I'm going to You hate my gift. No, I don't. <laughs> I don't hate it. <laughs> I have only tried it with the string cheese and it was a, it was a weird texture. I think cuz string, string cheese is String cheese is a weird texture. Well, it is. It's really super dry and so super low in moisture and and it's rubbery. And it's a little on the rubbery side. So, I'm going to try it with something else. I'm going to try it with some American and get myself some Ritz crackers, but I think it might turn out well. You can make your own easy cheese with this it stuff. Basically what is it is you and can, you just plug it in and it looks, seriously, you guys, it looks like a hot glue gun. <laughs> it's, it's, it's a little disturbing actually, <laughs> but thanks Sharon for your disturbing gift. Um, instead of making gingerbread houses at Christmas time, <laughs> you can make cheese houses with crackers and other fun food. But am I going to have a glue like substance that's going to keep everything together? If you use the right cheese. It says if you use, um, I think it's like American cheese, Jack cheese. Those are good cheeses to use. Cheddars get a little oily, apparently. Okay, well, I'm, I'm going to try it out. But you can use any cheese. I would be curious to see what blue cheese does in oh, there. Oh, no, I'm not. No, nope, not even touching that. Not even yeah. touching that with a 10 foot pole. Heat it up. <laughs> so, no, <laughs> no. Why not? That's, no. It'll be all pretty. No. How? Because it's all blue and white and maybe green. Gray. No. You don't know. <laughs> you don't know. I. <laughs> okay. Maybe for having a steak, but God, I, I like blue cheese crumbles, not. But for Valentine's Day, you can make Lee a steak and then you can <laughs> put like, I love you, Lee, <laughs> in blue cheese on a steak. He's going to be like, you're so yeah. weird. We're throwing that away. <laughs> no. <laughs> I think it could also be the gift that keeps on giving. Yeah. Once you've had a year of fun with this. Yeah. Oh, yeah. You could pass it on. I'm excited for that. Don't be excited to get rid of the fondue <laughs> You have a cheese party every year. People could pl- have a lot of fun oh, with that. Oh, you're right. We will probably bust it out for the cheese party and just have it available and just plugged in. Yeah. yeah. Okay. I feel good about that. I feel better about it now. <laughs> <clears throat> and now for the main course. Hey, Sharon. Yeah. Before we get to our main topic, 
Can I re- read a listener mail? Ooh, yes, please. Yes. So we got a listener mail from Catherine from New Zealand. Whoa. I know. This hey is so, there. I know. You're on the, comp- you're so far away from us, but I feel so close to you. So far away that it's a different season, but so close because you're in her email box. <laughs> yeah, it's awesome. Anyway, so she says um, she loves hearing about different foods and food history. So I'm glad that she's entertained by that. But she has a word to say with to you. Oh, about what? She says, I have to say that I disagree with you on the topic of fruitcake. <laughs> she says it's very popular, traditional here, and many people would still either make or partake of a proper fruit cake, a Christmas fruit cake, and or a Christmas pudding, kind of a steamed fruit cake over the Christmas holidays. I have very fond memories of helping my nana, her grandmother, make the annual cake and pudding, which were always started around September, Sharon. September. Oh, they're putting booze in it. Well, that's a proper fruit cake. (laughs) Let's talk about it some more. This is what she says. Making the cake and pudding require a lot of booze. (laughs) There you go. Vast amounts. that too. (laughs) Vast amounts of dried fruit were soaked in brandy and the baked cake was then quote unquote fed each week with more brandy. Oh, like a sourdough starter. (laughs) Kind of. Yeah, kind of. So feeding the cake involved unwrapping the cake from the layers of paper and stabbing holes in it with a skewer before pouring a good dose of booze over it. This was done every week or so for around three months. So you can imagine the alcohol content of the cake by Christmas. It's like a Dulce de Leche cake, but it's fruit cake, but it's boozy. Yep, basically. Mm. So, and then this is what she said um, that I didn't know about. So she said, right before Christmas, the cake was iced by a covering with a thin layer of marzipan and then Mm. a layer of royal icing made from egg whites and powdered sugar. I was never a great fan of the icing, so I would just peel it off of the slice of cake and give it to my sister. (laughs) That's what sisters are for. Nana also used to bake a silver ring and thimble in, oh, uh, bake a silver ring and thimble into the Christmas pudding for good luck. Oh, that's like a king cake almost. Yeah. At Mardi Gras. So silver, a silver ring and a thimble. And then she says, my favorite way of eating Christmas cake these days is with a slice of sharp cheddar, and that's a tradition um, in from Yorkshire, and a wee dram of single malt whiskey. <laughs> See, boozy I like, cake. I <laughs> this is how I want to eat fruit cake <laughs> as well. I, I, yes, I bet this would be very adventurous. I'll bet your dram of whiskey is pretty delightful there in New Zealand as well. <laughs> so, anyway, I might just invite myself to your home for the (laughs) Christmas holidays next year. Catherine, thanks for sending us an email. And she actually was the one that suggested our main topic today. Oh, because we've been talking a ton about Chinese hot pot. Yes. And so she just said, I'm wondering if you can talk about fondue. Yeah. And we're like, yeah, we're totally (laughs) all about that. So fondue, Sharon. Yes. What is fondue? It is a traditional Swiss dish. Swish dish. I can't say that. Say that. No, I'm nope, not going to do it. <laughs> this is one thing I didn't know because I thought it was French. Yeah. Totally thought it was French because I think it's the twist. word fondue is derived from a French word that means to melt. Yes. It's, I saw it. It was like the past participle. I don't know. It's the feminine past participle of something. <laughs> yeah. Yes. So a derivative of a word. Mm-hmm. But I really did think I, I'm now smarter and know that it is a Swiss invention of sorts. So, so cheese fondue is basically a combination of cheese, Mm -hmm. alcohol, yep, and maybe some cornstarch. Yes. And we'll talk about kind of each of those bits in about the science of how to put something together. But I kind of wanted to talk a little bit about the history because I yeah, I'm really excited. I about haven't it. delved into the history too much. I just know that it's Swiss. Yes. But I don't know where it comes from or what the origins are. Yeah. So th- they actually do mention cheese fondue as early as, I believe, 1699. There was a book that was mm. published and it talked about cooking cheese and wine together and dipping bread in it. That's where you can kind of maybe say that it came from. And then there's all these kind of different versions, right? The cheese is pretty basic. Bread is pretty basic. There's just a bunch of different things that could be kind of like, oh, this is kind of where it came from and this is what it originated from. But I'm just going to go with 
everybody likes cheese and bread together. Yeah. But this is the part that I thought was so interesting. Everybody, do you have a fondue pot in your possession? I do. Do you really? I do, but it's a, it's a more modern one. But there's a lot of people that have them from the 70s. My parents did. And then my mom got rid of it when they moved. And then my sister-in-law, when she was my very new sister-in-law, mm-hmm. got a fondue pot for my parents yeah. for a gift yeah. one year. My mom just kind of looked at it. She was like, well, what am I going to do with that? <laughs> because she totally thought it was just like this passing 70s fad. <laughs> oh, really? Yeah. Okay. Well, let's talk about that, actually. Yeah. Because my thought was, how did it get so popular in the 70s? Like, right? Yeah, I don't. Mm, right? Do you know? Yeah, I don't I do. know. I do. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay. It actually starts back in about 1914. Oh, okay. So World War II, sorry, excuse me. World War One had just ended and Europe was in a mess. Mm-hmm. However, the Swiss people were still doing okay. Their cows were still alive and they were still making plenty of cheese. But they were like, oh, we got to. We got to figure out a way to get our, move our cheese because, you know, we need to get back up on our feet. Okay. So, oh my gosh, I can't believe this. This this story is totally crazy. People that were once competitors in the cheese business, like making cheese in Switzerland, they decided to not be competitors anymore and form a Swiss cheese union. (laughs) Okay. It was basically a cartel and they they basically it was like as one person put it the OPEC of cheese and so they they created prices and kind of put embargoes on things that were not kind of the three main cheeses which I thought was kind of surprising so the only things that at the time you could make were hold on a second let me make sure that I've got the because I don't know how to say these some of them correctly but one of them was the Emmental you know what that? Oh, you've, yeah. That's a bland seen. cheese. It, yeah. Relatively so. Right. So Emmental was one of them. And then the other one was, um, I've never heard of this one before. It was Sprints. Does that sound? Oh, I don't know what that Are one is. Are you familiar with that? Mm-mm. And so um, there was that one. And then the other one. Oh, I'm totally, I've totally lost the name of it. Oh, mm-hmm. um, oh, Gruyere. So Gruyere, Emmental, and Sprints. Gruyere is my favorite. Yeah. It's good stuff. So... They created the Swiss Cheese Union or the Schweizer Casa Union. <laughs> I'm sorry if I... And it was just it basically was a marketing thing because they were like, how do we move our cheese? And so, like I said, they started in 1914 and they mandated certain productions and limited amounts of these three varieties and would basically say, if you made other cheeses, you couldn't make it. Whoa. They put the kibosh on everything and then they started marketing it like crazy. Like, okay, how can we sell more cheese to people? How can we have people consume our cheese at a greater rate? And so they're like, there's this, there's this one dish that people eat in the Alps. It's called fondue. Like it's just cheese and some bread. And so they started marketing it <laughs> and making it super trendy um, and they would like they would have posters of people um, in sweaters, good looking people in sweaters and having parties around these pots of fondue. Nice. Yeah. And so they it, it was all a marketing scheme. Fondue is all a marketing scheme because <laughs> it's this kind of like whatever dish they were trying to pass it off as like a healthy dish that people in the Alps would eat. And that eat type this of thing. bucket of cheese. No, seriously. It would like <laughs> all the way to the bottom is what they say. Go to the very bottom because at the very bottom, a crust develops and you get to eat it it's like a chip of cheese sure (laughs) i would eat that i would totally eat that so anyway they kind of talk about how people anybody that was making something other than those three main cheeses would kind of be rebels they were called cheese rebels and (laughs) oh my god would make cheese under and sell it under the table kind of a deal like just very on the down low of course, they're like a cheese prohibition. Yeah, yeah, it was. Okay. And it was just because of this um cartel, this big cheese cartel. And what happened was in um what ended up bringing them to the United States was the um World's Fair in oh, okay. the, in 1960, oh, I can't even in remember. In Chicago or It was in Hold on a second. I wrote it down somewhere and I don't remember now. St. Well, Louis. Where were the others? Oh, cities? Chicago. It was in Chicago. Okay. Um, and so they had it in the Swiss pavilion. Nice. 
and really pushed it there. And so that's when things started, like fondue really got big in the United States was <laughs> at this, like, I just couldn't believe it. It was all a marketing scheme. Like <laughs> that sounds terrible, but I, cause I love fondue. I think it tastes really good. And, but I think it was a racket. And there was a lot of bitter people in Switzerland, it sounds like, if you didn't like those three. That's true. And if you had your cows and you were trying to make a different different cheese, cheese, nope, not having it. Like, it's mm -mm, no Hmm. way, man. Anyway, so I thought that was fascinating that fondue is a creation, a marketing scheme once again, (laughs) once again. So how did it get popular in the 70s? It was because of that World's Fair. Oh, it was in 1960 something. Oh, okay. So and, then it picked up again. Yep. So it was really oh. popular in Europe and stuff like that. But then because they really marketed it heavily and it showed up in at the World's Fair. Yeah. It, it kind of went crazy there nice. here in the United States. And so hmm. that's why everybody in the 70s owned a fondue pot and it still persists because I have a fondue pot that's more modern. Yeah. I took my mom's fondue pot that my sister-in-law gave her. Yeah. So, oh, it was the 1964 World's Fair. Sorry. It was in New York City. Apologies. <laughs> um, okay. So the other thing I wanted to tell you about that I think is, so that obviously there is the Swiss fondue, but there's other types of fondues. You can have a broth fondue and they kind of talk about that as in French, it is fondue chinois, which is Chinese fondue. So that's the hot pot. You know, I always talk about hot pot, hot pot all the time. That's basically what it is. So it's broth based. And then you can have ch- um, you can have chocolate fondue, yummy. And the way that actually came about was because there was a um, there was a chef that was asked to do an event for Toblerone, the oh, chocolate. Yeah. And so they kind of did the same thing, except for the things that were dipping are sweeter fruits and yeah, sweeter breads and that type of thing, marshmallows. And then you could have oil based um, fondue, where it's like deep frying something, basically. Yeah, you do like cubes of meat and stuff yeah. like that mm-hmm. in the yep. oil. And that's pretty good because I think you can get some pretty tasty stuff going. And then you can also do wine, a wine-based one. And a lot of times it's red wine with spices and that type of thing. So that's kind of the general. Like a mold cider almost. Kind of, yeah. They a mold wine. The stuff they usually put into it are salt and pepper, um, herbs, onions, garlic, just kind of basic stuff. I don't know how that would taste. I don't know oh, if I would like, like that or not. Um, I made those burgundy mushrooms one oh. christmas party mm-hmm. i don't know if you remember that it was several years ago now yeah i remember but those. they were just stewed in a bunch of wine and some other savory things like was garlic too. and herbs and stuff so maybe the same yeah deal okay you can have a white wine as a white one wine one as well and it will have some chicken broth to kind of mm-hmm. boost it up but that one uh they have said that you can put in things like white pepper, coriander, chilies kind of to That'd cut through tasty. that. Even cinnamon. So there's a lot of things that people like to dip, apparently. It's a oh, thing. Yeah. There's something, I feel like there's something really nice about fondue. I I, I get why it, the marketing scheme went viral. <laughs> oh, yeah. Because you're said, love dipping food. Like yeah. you dip your cookies in milk mm-hmm. or nachos. Yeah. Things like that. It's and good. and you're sitting around a table and just having good conversation. I think that I can I can see why it, it took off. Oh yeah. I can see why it took off. Anyway. It's interesting. Wine is actually not just a for a main ingredient mm-hmm. like in a wine fondue, but it's also a main ingredient in cheese fondue. Yes, it is. And so why why do they have wine? Well, it's used partly for flavor, but it also provides a counterbalance to the heaviness of the fat. Mm. And it acts as an acid at the same time. So it clarifies the flavor and it thins the cheese out to a proper consistency. So then the casein proteins in the cheese, they won't clump and they won't get stringy because of the added wine. Okay. And you can also use it like if you if your cheese sauce kind of freezes up a little bit. Yeah. So it gets thick and just right. hard to stir. You can put a splash of wine in there. And to kind of thin it out. Mm-hmm, that'll help break it a little bit without actually breaking the sauce. Now, what kind of wine are we talking about? White wines. And okay. you want a dry wine. So that means it's not sweet. Okay. Um, the sweeter wines can tend to... Um, compete with the flavor of I was the about, cheese yeah i was about to say like you want the cheese to sing i think mm-hmm. 
And tell me about the proportion. Is there a certain proportion? Because obviously you don't want too much wine or else it's going to be too watery and you're not going to get enough. Um, proportions vary. Like some people mm-hmm. are putting up to a cup of wine. Some people are just using like a quarter cup of wine. It kind of depends on your recipe. Oh, okay. Okay. But the tartaric acid in the wine is the most important ingredient that, that acts as the acid. As the acid. And so if you don't want to make it with white wine, say you're not a drinker, mm-hmm. um, a lot of kids are going to be consuming the fondue, that right. kind of thing. Um, you can also use lemon juice or you can play around with vinegar and lemon juice. So is that, will that cause any problems though? Like No, it- the lemon juice kind of provides a brightness of flavor. Mm, okay. Um, you can try using a, like a cooking wine, mm-hmm. but I wouldn't recommend it. Okay. It's not very good cooking okay. wine. You generally want to use a type of wine that you would also drink. Um, it's pretty common to also use the same wine that you used in your fondue to partake of while partake you- with your fondue while you eat it. Okay. Okay. And can you talk about the cheeses? Well, the cheeses are typically they're Gruyere, Fontina, and the Emmental. Uh-huh. Emmentaler. I like Fontina a lot. I like it too. It melts well. I heard um, that there's, I, I, I've heard that you don't want something a, too soft, a di- sorry, too soft of a cheese because then it gets too stringy quickly. Yes. Well, you don't really want a hard cheese either because then it, because the harder cheeses melt at a higher temperature, but, and you kind True, of. True, but if you grate them mm. instead of chunking them up, if you actually grate like your Gruyere. Yes. Because that's a harder. That's a harder that's cheese. A hard aged cheese. But if you grate it, it will melt really smoothly. So I, that just makes sense because there's more surface area. So you yep. can, it'll just, it'll melt at a better, maybe more consistent rate. At a consistent rate and at a lower temperature. The alcohol also keeps the boiling point lower. Okay. And so that, um, I the other thing that when I was doing some research is that the cheese, the casein, like you said, at higher temperatures does have a tendency to clump. And when it clumps, it kind of seizes up and then forces out the water and the oils out. So it separates into this yucky mess. that's when it's called quote unquote breaking. Oh, okay. So like your sauce breaks at that point. Mm -hmm. Like if you're ever making like a bechamel sauce. It's kind of that same deal. The sauce kind of seizes up and then you've got this part of it's thick and clumpy. Uh Uh-huh. And, and then other part is like water, oily, but it's oil brothery. and gross. Yeah. yeah. And then you can't mix them back together and it's nasty. So when that starts to happen, um, if you get it at the right time, mm-hmm, you mm-hmm. can just put a splash of your acid, whether it's lemon juice uh-huh. or white wine, okay. you can just put that in there. And, and then just, are you mixing constantly? Too, yes. Right? Stir it constantly okay. and it should be good to go. Okay. That's good to know. Now, what about the cornstarch? Cornstarch is usually used as an added insurance type of a thing for thickening. So I, I've heard that also it acts as an emulsifier. So it helps not, so it doesn't separate things out. Mm-hmm. Kind of coats everything nicely. Right. You want, if you're using cornstarch, you want to u- make sure that most of your cheese gets coated with that. Nice. Nice. Hmm. Okay. Well, I have made some successful fondue mixes. Have you? And not so successful ones. <laughs> it was pretty embarrassing the one time. And I didn't use a white wine because I was amongst people that didn't want that. Right. So I was trying to find some other options. And what was your option that you used? It was not a good idea. I think I used, I found a non alcoholic wine. Yeah. Cooking wine is disgusting. Don't ever use it. So I, it was kind <laughs> of a disaster, actually. I, it was sad. You're better off using like a quality vinegar yeah. than you are um, just the cooking wine that's like a couple bucks at the store. Yeah, it was kind of sad. Aww. And it, it was like good cheese too. Oh. And it was like, I just wasted a ton of cheese and it's just weird and clumpy and gross. Yeah. Wah-wah. But I do like, so we have an, a friend and she has a wonderful fondue recipe. Yes. That she has shared with us and we love it. And I've eaten many, well, many, like half a dozen times, I feel like. Yeah, many. I've had it many times. Yeah, it's really good. So, and I, I think she just used, she uses Gruyere. Mm-hmm. Um, what else does she use in there? Um, I don't know. 
Did she send you the recipe by no. chance? No, she didn't. Um, we might talk her into <laughs> sharing her fondue recipe with you all. Yes. Yes. <laughs> and if you're listening, um, you should Pacific yeah. Northwest chef mom. Yeah. You <clears> should <throat> send that to us. Please send it to us. We should totally do that. Um, I think she uses wine though. Actually, I'm pretty sure she does. Yeah. I'm pretty um, sure she does. And wine. Most of it cooks out. We know that not all of it cooks out technically, mm -hmm. but most of it cooks out. So it's not a huge worry with that. But yeah, she, I've seen her, I've watched her make it. She, it's only like a couple of ingredients. It's very quick and easy. Mm -hmm. And then she does, I think this is different, is that things that she dips in yeah. is obviously bread, mm -hmm. but she also has like vegetables and stuff. Yep. That's so good. Yeah, she'll make a full meal with that. She'll I've had it with bread, meats, pretzels, lots of veggies. Yes. Lots of different kinds of veggies. It's really good. Is there anything else that you wanted to bring up? Sometimes people put something called kirsch in the fondue. Oh. Um, that is a cherry flavored uh brandy. Cherry flavored? What? Yeah. So it's actually called Kirschwasser. <laughs> I'm sure I didn't pronounce that we correctly. Are doing it's so, we are doing so awesome today on our... I pronounced it correctly in American. Yeah. <laughs> I was pretty excited about my Casa Union. <laughs> Schweizer Casa Union. <laughs> so Kirschwasser is German, meaning cherry water. Mm. Um, it's a cherry brandy. It's clear, usually. Um, but it's not sweet. It's tart cherry. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so it's usually just a little bit added to the fondue, typically... Um, just for flavor. Okay. And you've got that added alcohol acidity. But I just can't imagine the cherry flavored. Just a little bit. Okay. It adds depth to the cheese. Okay. I'm interested to try some of that at some point in time. Yeah. Kirschwater. Kirschwasser. <laughs> just kidding. Yeah. Unfortunately, um, it's not usually sold in small bottles. Oh. So you have oh. to get like a giant bottle of the stuff <laughs> that you're never really going to use unless you make fondue. Because <laughs> you don't really, oh, I'm just going to drink this. It's not that. It's not that good. Apparently. It's not like the dram of whiskey that our friend Catherine <laughs> is drinking with her fruitcake. Her boozy fruit, fruit cake, Which I would love to have with her. <laughs> it's it's not like that. Okay. You don't just sit and no. sit around and sip No. It. You're not sharing that with, you're not passing that around. No. Okay. Well, it's good to know. I don't. Have you, um, did you know that there's fondue etiquette? Um, I would suspect there is fondue etiquette because uh, it's a communal pot. It is. I, I would say no double dipping. Definitely no double dipping. Right. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yep. Um, the fondue fork. So I don't know if you've ever noticed those fancy forks, yes. but they, they're the long, they're tel like a telescoping yeah. fork, except the actual prongs on them usually aren't that long yeah they're usually a little bit shorter and that is actually designed for hygiene so when you oh you pierce your bread mm -hmm. or whatever you've yeah, yeah. got to dip in so you pierced you pierce it but it, the tines don't go all the way through they just go in maybe about halfway mm -hmm. or less and so you dip it and then you're supposed to take that piece off with just your front teeth so your lips and your tongue and your teeth are Do actually not. never supposed to touch your fork. Oh. Because Hygiene. you're sharing this big pot of cheese oh. with everybody else. Oh. And nobody else wants your germs. No. We don't want them. Um, another way to eat fondue is that fork is actually not designed to be your dinner fork. It's just a dipping fork. So dip, put it on your plate, use a different fork? Yep. You okay. use your dinner fork to... To bread remove what, oh, okay. the the piece of bread or whatever, whatever you've speared, the speared food with mm -hmm. the cheese on it. Okay, you use your dinner fork so to remove a, that. From it's a transporting fork, fork, basically. Mm -hmm. It's not a. It's not technically the eating fork. Yes, it's not the eating fork. So you've got a lot of forks in play. Okay. So when your mm -hmm. fondue fork is not in use, it should be on your plate. Whoa, whoa, whoa! Yeah, I think that's very interesting. I there's always etiquette. Yeah. Be be hygienic when you're mm -hmm. sharing your communal food there. Yeah. Can I tell you about one other thing that I found super interesting? Yeah. There is a lot of discussion slash opinions about what you're supposed to drink. <laughs> 
when you're eating fondue. Did you know that? Yes. Like people say either you should be drinking white wine, like you said, kind of mm-hmm. mentioned that before. That's you drink that, you put it into your fondue. It's all kind of, you yeah. know. And other people say black tea. And mm-hmm. other people take a shot of a spirit of some sort, really, you know, strong. The Kirschwasen. Something before and after. Because hmm. they want to, they say it's supposed to aid in digestion. Mm-hmm. Okay. There was a study in 2010 Ooh. <laughs> at the University of Zurich. Okay. <laughs> I love people that do funny things, do cool, random um, scientific studies. <laughs> This would have been a fun grad student study. Of I some know. Sort. So they had, and they, there was, I just want to say there was an MRI involved. Ooh. <laughs> so people would eat the, the cheese, they would eat the fondue and then they would have, um, either alcohol. So some curse, mm-hmm. um, beforehand, uh, or after, or yeah, I guess during, and then they would also have just, I think it was black tea was the other thing that they, okay. <laughs> And they definitely saw that if you had the alcohol, it was just kind of sitting there. <laughs> sitting there like lead. In a, yeah, just kind of, it doesn't, yeah. It didn't contribute to an increase in indigestion, but it didn't really necessarily help with the digestion. digestion per se. Well, and because they had did an MRI, it's legit. Yeah. It's a legit study. It, it kind of, it kind of slowed down the process of, um, digestion too because like they they even looked at it like six hours later and the, the stomach was still full i believe it yeah <laughs> based on experiences i believe it. <laughs> so just to just because you but can I'll do bet the study. tea because the tea has lots of tannins and other things and that that can kind of help with digestion yeah i imagine yeah because i've or I you could just I drink, drink water too I'm, like they also talked about just doing after dinner and stuff yeah hmm. so Kind of makes sense. So University Hospital of Zurich, good job for doing the most random <laughs> <laughs> little bit of research. I love that. Good job. Our podcast is brought to you by our awesome and food loving sponsor. You guys our sponsor. This episode is once a month meals. Yay. We are loving partnering with them. They are basically, they help us get food on the table faster by helping us prepare freezer meals ahead of time so that, bam, you get home, toss it into your slow cooker, your instant pot, the oven, on the stovetop, whatever, right? Mm-hmm. And, and and you get food on the table faster. Yep. Maximizes your efficiency and your time with your family. It is so, so nice. And we have a special listener discount. Yeah. Which is so nice. You can get 15% off through February 15th um, if you enter Hungry15 at checkout. And if you do it through our affiliate link, which is secure.onceamonthmeals.com slash affiliate slash hungry squared. And we'll have that link because it's really long. We'll have it in our show notes. Yep. So 15% off Hungry15. So monthly plans are $16. And if you want a yearly plan, it's 170 yeah. That includes all of your recipes and your grocery lists and all of the things to help you succeed in maximizing your time with your family. Yeah, it's so awesome. So thanks again, once a month meals. Let's have a food fight. Food fight, food fight, food fight, food fight. It's winter. This is a segment where you can email us with your relationship questions relating to food. You can email us at hungrysquared at gmail.com. Disclaimer, we are in no way professional relationship experts, but you should totally listen to us anyway. If you need professional help, please seek it out. Food fight, food fight, food fight. The food fight segment of the show. Here we go. Winter, what's this week's question? I think we'll both have something to say about this question. (laughs) At least I know I will. (laughs) It says, Dear Sharon and Winter, sorry if this question has been asked, but I have a I've got a problem with my husband. (laughs) That's the way she started out. I just want to point out. We cook amazing food and always have leftovers, but he refuses to eat any leftovers. It's driving me nuts. What do I do? Signed, running out of Tupperware. (laughs) Oh dang. Okay. I can relate to this. Can you? Oh, yes, I can. I I can as well. So are you relating to it like I'm in the same situation or have you found ways around this or ways to encourage your 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 significant other to eat leftovers? 
Or are you the one that doesn't eat leftovers? No, I, I eat them. Oh, okay. I eat them. Ike doesn't eat them. Okay. I'm calling him out. <laughs> Ike will not eat leftovers. Oh, snap. He'll eat them if they're like his very favorite food ever. So it's really limited to what he'll actually eat That's in it. terms of leftovers. Oh, my gosh. So? So I make the kids eat them. Oh. And do they eat them? Yeah. Because that's what's there. Because they don't want to eat cereal for dinner. <laughs> <laughs> so we'll have a leftover night. Um, I will also, I'll eat the leftovers. I will happily eat them. And I'm trying to be healthier and stuff and cook more meals at home. So I'll bring those to work um, instead of going and buying lunch. It's cheaper. Um, oh, yeah. And I hate food waste. Hate, hate, hate food waste. So I'll eat them. And it's since um, the bigger meals that we cook are usually when the weeks that we have or weeks and days and months, whatever, mm -hmm. that we have the kids. Mm -hmm. So they're usually eating seconds. They've got gross spurts, that kind of thing. And so usually we only have like one or two servings left over. So it's not that big of a deal. Um, but sometimes if we've had, you know, a big week mm -hmm. of some sort, maybe one's not been that, as hungry as he normally is, that kind of thing, we'll have lots of leftovers. And so then we just have like a clean the fridge night. Yeah, that's a good idea. So Lee, I'm going to call him out too. <laughs> Doesn't like to eat leftovers. What? He makes the best food though. Why wouldn't you want to eat that again? Well, let me just tell you, I think it's just because he's too tall and he can't bend down and look into the refrigerator. <laughs> <laughs> okay. That's... Maybe you should elevate your refrigerator. I know. Apparently we need to get a different refrigerator or something. Oh, anyway. Okay. So he, this is what would happen before. He would make stuff. Or I would make stuff and he just was not all about it. He doesn't like to bring a Tupperware. He didn't want to have to track down a microwave. I mean, it was a ha it was kind of a hassle and he doesn't have time to. So I think leftovers are a little bit more conducive to people that work in an office setting, right? He was not True. working in an office setting. He was working in a restaurant and right. it was busy. Yeah. So there was like no way that he could nuke that, sit down and eat it. It was like, you're, you got to. When you're at a restaurant, like, I mean, Ike has been a chef for many years. Yeah. And they usually get, like, a free meal mm -hmm. or an extremely discounted meal. Exactly. With each shift that they work. Yeah. Several to Well, because Ike's been a chef, and same with Lee, I'm sure, they usually, they're the ones that got to prepare the meal. Yeah. So they had more leeway, even with, like, um, some restaurants have, like, an employee menu. Like, you're allowed Where, to have, like, these mm, mm -hmm. five these to ten meals or whatever or items on the menu. Like, this can be your food. Yeah. But when you're the chef, you can kind of play around with that. Yeah, but it's not bad. It's just not bad. So, Lee, okay. So, at one point in time, I, food waste drives me crazy, too. Because I, we would, we were purchasing food and we were making enough. And that's a, another problem that we have. And I, this was maybe the thing that helped us was that Lee cannot cook for just two people. He cooks for like 12 people because that's just <laughs> what he does. I don't know what his problem is, but he really cannot cook for a small amount of people. And so we have leftovers for days and I will eat the leftovers and I will bring them to work day after day after day. And by the end of the week, I'm like, I'm done eating this, uh, x thing whatever we had well yeah because you have to eat the same thing for days yeah like chicken noodle soup he cannot make a small pot of that i'm Aww. just saying so like having you know days of chicken noodle soup is nice after the third day it's like okay i'm done done with soup yeah so so i have encouraged him to chill out a little on the serving <laughs> size and i kind of just i kind of got him after him because i was like if you're not going to eat the leftovers then you cannot make so much because then Cut we your don't, recipe in half. Yeah, basically. And so cut your recipe in half if you know he's not going to eat it. And then I was like, okay, why are you not eating them? And it was kind of like, I think he was, we were just making some stuff that he was not super crazy about. Yeah. So that's Ike too. So I lately have been trying to plan our meals. Like, hey, what do you mm -hmm. want? Like, what are you craving this mm -hmm. week? Do you have any cravings? What sounds really good to you? Yeah. That, you know, hey, we haven't had this in a long time or... That just sounds amazing. Right. Right. So if you can kind of plan for something that they're mm -hmm. excited about, that's good. I think also maybe utilizing your freezer a little bit. Yeah. Because most food that you make is going to freeze okay. Yeah. It might not freeze for six months. No. But it will freeze for at least a month. So like bringing out neck the following week and, and it's a new meal. So when you're both like 
tired from work and you don't know what to make, yeah, you've got something in your freezer that you yeah. could have. Yeah, that's definitely a possibility. I'm trying to think if there's anything else that would be helpful because that is, yeah. That, that's the bane of many household existences. Yeah, because you just waste so much food. Nobody likes to eat the leftovers. Yeah. I know some people who are able to repurpose their leftovers into something new. Like oh. their Sunday roasts are now tacos. Oh, that yeah. Kind of thing. That's a great idea, actually. Um, So if you can easily repurpose the leftovers, then that's great. Especially if you've like grilled some meat. Mm-hmm. Um, You've got a main meat dish. Yep. Because then you can use it as a topping for salad or you could use it as a filling for a taco or something yeah, like some that. Yeah, some sort of Mexican food, enchilada, enchilada. something <laughs> or another. Yeah. Heck, you can make some... Yeah, we just had nachos the other day and we, we kind of yeah. did the same thing. We just put the shredded meat, whatever we had left over on top. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it worked really good. And a lot of restaurants get creative with what they put as toppings on different types of food, like nachos and stuff like that. I mean, I've seen macaroni and cheese on them. Okay, that's a little much. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> but I mean, you could try it. You know what I mean? You like, could try it. You could try it and see what happens. Just saying. Okay. You could try it. I hope you have additional Tupperware in your future and that this helps a little bit (laughs) because I, unfortunately, if they're not going to eat it, they're not going to eat it. So, um, you got to make your peace with it. And maybe, you know, if you have some friends or neighbors that could do with some, some dinner or I always have coworkers that are tied to their desks. Yeah. And you're like, here, eat this. Yeah. That's Um, nice of you. Um, yeah, I have in the past brought them like my extra lunch because I have maybe a couple of days worth of lunch. Mm -hmm. So I've brought them like a serving of lunch and that goes a long way. Let me just tell you with like a cranky boss (laughs) or cranky coworkers, stressed out people and they don't have time for food or your food options are pretty limited, especially when you're on a super tight schedule. Right. It goes a long way. It's better than just getting lunch from the vending machine. Right. They'll love you forever. They will love you forever. Well, I hope those work for you. I'm sorry. It's kind of a, it's a battle. It is. You love your husband, right? It's (laughs) going to be okay. It's going to be okay. Don't let your lack of Tupperware come between you. You could just buy more. (laughs) Thanks for joining us today for our show. You can find us at HungrySquared.com on iTunes, Stitcher, and Google Play Music. Please subscribe to our podcast. We are just having so much fun here and we love it when you guys send us emails and give us like questions and stuff like that. It's been so fun. So thanks for reaching out to us. We love you guys so much. Okay. So please join us next month, next week, next month too, but next week (laughs) for our next episode of Food Nerdery. Okay, oh, love you. Bye. Hungry squared, yeah, hungry squared.